Дорогие друзья, уважаемые коллеги, мы рады приветствовать вас на нашей сегодняшней лекции. Большое спасибо всем, кто подключился. Сегодняшняя лекция будет полностью проведена в дистанционном формате на базе платформы Zoom. И мы прежде всего благодарим нашего дорогого молодого коллегу Оливье Винштерфера из университета Цюриха, аспиранта, который занимается балканской романской лингвистикой. И сегодня он любезно согласился прочитать по нашему приглашению, принял приглашение или согласился прочитать лекцию о Балканах, которая будет называться «Балканы и Балканский языковой союз». Очень, две, два очень любимых и очень спорных концепта в лингвистике. Лекция будет прочитана на английском языке, но наш коллега Оливье прекрасно владеет и русским языком тоже. Поэтому, дорогие коллеги, если у вас будут возникать вопросы по ходу лекции или в конце вы захотите задать вопрос на русском языке, вы можете тоже пользоваться этой возможностью. Можно писать в чате, можно задавать вопросы по-русски. Мы надеемся, что наш коллега сможет их увидеть, прочитать и ответить на них. Uh, good evening, dear colleagues. Uh, we are glad um, to see you at our lecture. Uh, we will uh, discuss today uh, some aspects of Balkan linguistics. And uh, it's uh, a big honor for us that our young colleague from the University of Zurich, Olivier Vinish Turfer, um, will speak about the Balkans and the Balkan Sprachbund, two very loved and very despised concepts in linguistics. Olivier is a PhD candidate of, uh, at the University of Zurich. He has studied comparative romance linguistics and evolutionary linguistics at the University of Zurich. And we are going to discuss these two uh, concepts in Balkan linguistics of the Balkans, uh, Balkan languages, um, all of them, and Greek also, uh, like a part of this Balkan Sprachbund. So now the floor is yours. We are Uh, uh, all ears, please. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Um, first of all, thank you for really pronouncing well my name. Even in Switzerland, people are struggling normally. So like, I'm like, whew, I'm like really happy. Thank you very much for this. Yes. Yeah, so um, it will be a more or less, let's say, a basic introduction to to some of these of these two concepts. So uh, if if for for like. Um, linguists with a lot of experience most of all in this in this area it might be not that insightful so sorry to some of the colleagues that i've already seen like maxim makartev and others uh also greetings out to them and also to other people um so yes so let's start so um the balkans um i don't know how much you're into social media and these things but here in switzerland uh we are the balkans are everywhere you could now say of course because we have a huge migration from the balkans mostly from uh, former yugoslavia mostly macedonia uh, and from kosovo and uh yeah the balkans in social media a little bit everywhere there are one hand these jokes about uh the varieties the south slavic varieties in the balkans as you can see to the left with all of them fighting about stuff. There are these jokes on social media, mostly within Roman linguistics, with uh, Romanian, the weird cat that somehow tries to be part of the Roman languages. But there's also others like, um, you see this world versus Balkans. Uh, these videos are really popular in Switzerland. Um, I think the, the producer of these videos actually is from Sweden here, but it's beautiful because it's always this Balkans against the world. Uh, we in the Balkans, we are completely different. And um, we will talk, uh, I will talk about this a little bit and I hope you will talk with me about it. This question of what is actually Balkans? Because some of these flags there are interesting that they are posted in this video. And then of course, again, another joke about Romanian and its difficult stance within the Roman languages. Um, so um, on the table of contents first, like what I would like to talk. So uh, first would be the Balkans, a club uh, many do not want to be part of. Uh, then, like the, this concept of uh, the Balkan Sprachbund, uh, which uh, is a very well known concept within linguistics, most of all linguistic typology and language contact, uh, but also with uh, many questions to be answered. Then, I would discuss also a little bit because um, 
you have a Greek background or like most of you are studying Greek or have been working in, ling in linguistic research on the Greek language, uh, the question of the, the position of the Greek language within the Balkans, and then some features, just because I like to talk about them of these languages, and then some final remarks. So um, let's go in. So first of all, the question, uh, where are the Balkans? And I thought, okay, let's let's Google it and let's see what what is the uh, what is uh, what Google suggests. And this is a map uh, that I found uh, on uh, the internet, which suggests these are the Balkans. And one main question that we could ask right now is 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 this the Balkans? Um, because as um, the, there are many problems, and maybe some of you have different opinions. I don't know whether we want to make it a little bit interactive with some students saying something. Um, so we could start asking <laughs> the students. You can ask, as suggested, also speak in Russian, of course, or in any language. Uh, maybe I understand it, maybe not. Um, what do you think? Uh, is this the Balkans? Is something missing? Is something that should be there? Uh, is something missing, or is something there that shouldn't be there? In your opinion? Anybody? Any suggestions? Guys, are you here? Yes. <laughs> and, um, okay. Yes, we are here. Yeah. Okay. So, perfect. What are your thoughts about Balkans? About the Balkans? Ну, может быть, если не включена Словакия, то Словения тоже как бы не должна быть тут. Но в целом, наверное, я согласна с этой картой. Mm -hmm. Okay, and for example, we could ask, uh, what about Turkey? Uh, most of all, I don't see, you see, I don't know whether you see my cursor, for example, here. Um, so I think yeah, Turkey see. should be in this union, should mm -hmm. be in both because we have a lot of uh, words for example from Turkish and uh, from other languages which are Balkan words mm -hmm. yes that's a, that's a good point and um well one point I was also maybe expecting because this in in our western perception for example when I see such a map for me shocking is when Greece is on this in on this map as Balkan. And um, uh, this is like personal note. Uh, we had discussions and my Albanian friends were shocked that for, for many of us, because we had a discussion within colleagues that, that Greece should be part of the Balkans. And they were like, but this is the same peninsula. How can you not see this? I am from, from the south of Albania. This, these are my neighbors. And this is like a huge point. And we can we can continue that because we see this in the next map. Uh, this is the map um, produced by Crampton and Danforth. Um, and it, here, for example, where they try to show the diversity uh, of ethnic groups in the Balkans, they exclude straight away Greece. So. They, they say, this is the Balkans, but Greece actually is not part. And we can now, of course, also discuss the power of maps. And we could discuss this for hours, the question, when do we justify our maps and how do we justify our maps? But this is it interesting because here in our Western view, I would say mostly Italy, Switzerland, Germany, Greece is not considered part of this. Um, my colleague, um, Maxim Makartsev, has also presented here two years ago, and he has mentioned this problem in the case of uh, Brian Joseph's um, question to, to the US um, funding system, I think, it's, if I remember correctly, where they said, that, well, Greece somehow is not Eastern Europe, and Greece somehow is not Western Europe. And here, for example, we would say, well, Greece is clearly part. It's um, a question that has often been discussed. Um, uh, for example, Edgar Hirsch, a professor for Eastern European uh, history, has discussed that this view was also actually uh, proposed by many Greek scholars who, after the fall uh, of Constantinople, came to Western Europe, that they, they suggested, well, Greece, as the cradle of democracy, as everything, as our, our the founding father of our democracy, which we like to see in this way in Western Europe, must be part of Western Europe. So this view is highly interesting. And we can see on the one hand um, that this question is, is much problematic. We also see here the beautiful uh, diversity within the Balkans that we uh, I will would like to discuss later. Um, but yes, 
So first, uh, let's start with with the question of the Balkans. And uh, I thought I put this here because, uh, as many of the students might know, um, the name Balkans actually is quite recent. Uh, in the ancient, uh, the ancient denomination, which also in Western Europe was mostly used, was Hamos, Hamus, uh, coming from Greek Aimos. Well, there's a huge discussion whether it's actually Greek or whether it's either Thracian or from another substrate. Uh, which is uh, assumed to me to mean mountain rich. Um, what we can see in that moment uh, for the modern denomination Balkan, it is um, it comes from Turkish Strait. Uh, we know this. Um, it is actually mostly used in the plural so in the first documents from the Ottoman Empire, which is Balkan Lar, which also means like steep mountain range. So um, we could also argue whether this denomination was actually uh, clear to the Turkish uh, when they arrived. Interestingly, the denomination Balkan actually was not first mentioned uh, in, um, in the Ottoman system, in Ottoman documents, but in a letter by Filippo Bonacorsi uh, to the Pope Innocent VIII uh, in 1490. In the Ottoman documents, we find it the first time in 1565. Um, we uh, also have to mention that uh, this question of this denomination Balkans actually has in his history always had a pejorative view. Um, we will discuss this later uh, when we come to my favorite example from uh, Slavoj Žižek, um, but also Hirsch has clearly uh, explained that many of these countries actually uh, did not agree on any of these denominations. Um, we, I personally know this mostly from the Romanian uh, tradition, where uh, being considered Balkan is, in many aspects, not accepted in within bulk, uh, within Romanian linguistics and also within uh, Romanian history. Um, yes. So what this this pejorative view on the Balkans had always also had an impact on the study and how it was seen. Um, because when we start with the de delimitation as uh, one of the students, I'm sorry if I didn't see the name. Uh, so, but yes, uh, the, the question normally with East and West is quite clear because we have there the seas, we have to the East, uh, the Black Sea, we have to the West, the Adriatic Sea, to the South, the Aegean Sea. Well, even though it depends on the view, because uh, as I mentioned before, mostly in the Western world, we would make the cut in North, uh, Northern Greece. Um, but um, most of all, when we go to the North, there's a huge discussion. Um, we have suggestions for the this delimitation of the Balkans to the north, uh, most of all with the Danubian uh, uh, River. Uh, but however, this uh, has also been thought and uh, there is um, there are still many debates, uh, many discussions. Um, what um, we can say is, as Friedman also has said, Victor Friedman, one of the most important uh, linguists on Balkan studies, uh, he said, uh, the northern delimitation of the Balkans, I cite, I cite uh, cannot be set in any non-arbitrary way that is applicable without qualifications uh, uh, in terms of either politics or linguistics. End of citation. And uh, this view, this is a, a major uh, issue here because uh, traditionally, mostly in history, uh, Edgar Hirsch also points that out, um, this this denomination or delimitation of Balkans has often been assumed with the influence sphere of the Orthodox Church, but also of others, uh, political questions. And one of the most famous uh, cases here, oh, sorry, by the way, I see there was quite some things in the chat. Um, oh, oh, this is from you about uh, the Pontic Greek. Yes, this is a good question. Um, I mean, well, we, we could dare also argue when we when we say, well, is it actually the Black Sea? Because we, we have this delimitation. We know that there is Istanbul, but we also know that in most of all in Turkish uh, linguistics, that the influence sphere, first of all, of Istanbul, uh, but also of languages that were present there in these regions is much stronger than often assumed. We also have to be honest there, there is a strong cut between um, Turkish linguistics and Balkan linguistics. Unfortunately, these Turkish varieties are like the presence of languages in Turkey, but also like of other, 
of other varieties, I mean, Armenian languages or varieties of the Greek varieties, there's this cut, which is often like uh, quite strong and not really uh, helpful. What I now would like to show you is like a beautiful example from uh, Slavoj Žižek, but now I just realized maybe you will not hear it. Uh, so I will have to check. I hope it works. Otherwise, I have to uh, share the screen again just to make sure that you hear it. So let's try. Uh, and you don't hear anything, right? No. OK, I have to share it again. I'm sorry. I completely forgot about that because in the sharing options, I should have chosen that. So now, um, yes, now you should be able to hear it. Let's hope for the best. Where no. is Balkan? This was a standard it, right? joke. Let me do what is... the entire <laughs> Okay. Here, but but the, the you have the present uh, the mode of the presenter, so I have to. Ah, uh, you don't see the screen, right? Or what? Yeah, we we see as yes, the the mode of the presenter. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, just and uh, maybe that's a problem. I uh, just check here because I don't hear anything either, which is weird. Which should not be the case. We, um, we hear it. Yeah, we could hear it the the second time. Ah, uh, you could hear it. Yeah. Okay. okay, I cannot hear it, but you can hear it. It's like. Beautiful. Um, so, now <laughs> you this, so now you see the screen um, and then I will play for you. I mean, I know it by heart almost because I love this, this scene. So let's try. If you can hear it, please tell me if or, or, or tell me if you don't hear it. I don't hear it, unfortunately. Where is Balkan? This was a standard joke. Yes, Let me do it. the entire Perfect. theory. So we have here Slovenia and every Slovene will tell you this is the limit. Here Balkan confusion starts. Okay, then let's go on. You ask a Croat, he will tell you it is clear. Croats are Middle Europa, Catholic, Belgrade, Serbia, Orthodox religion. We are in uh, Balkan. You ask a Serb, he will tell you down here either Sarajevo or Kosovo, they will tell you this is the true Balkan. Now, the irony is that if you go too much down, then all of a sudden Balkan is up there. No? In Greece, they will tell you, we Greeks, we are the origin of Europe, up there, the dark Balkan mountains. If you ask an Austrian, he will tell you, Slovenia, Balkan begins, Slavic, primitives, and so on. If you ask a German, he will tell you Austria, when they had an empire, was already too much mixed with all this, it's already Balkanized. French people will tell you Germany, dark, fascist, kind of a Balkan, we are civilization. And finally, the British will tell you all Europe is today a big Balkan with Brussels bureaucracy as a new Istanbul. We British are the only one. Yes. So it is beautiful because um, we can we, we know this uh, rhetoric uh, like also like this rhetoric tool also from other nations, from other questions. Um, for example, in the case of Austria, there's this famous citation that you always hear in the Austrian, in Austrian uh, society um, that the Balkans start at Renweg, that's a part of Vienna, where mostly people from former Yugoslavia live. So this idea of south of Vienna, it starts. We can also see this, of course, in Switzerland, we also like to make these jokes. We, for example, here in Bern, where I'm from, we make these jokes about Zurich, that they're already Austria, and these, these things. This is, a, this is a pattern that we can observe. But this quite, many of these points that uh, Zizek actually mentions uh, are really uh, frequent uh, in the discourse. Um, this is uh, the reason for this discourse is also a historical one. And I will continue, we will see this afterwards. And uh, it is about here, uh, about we start, we come back to this map, um, because why are the Balkans so interesting for, for or like, or so different? On the one hand, we can really say that the Balkans are um, a cultural sponge. Uh, this is most of all, I think, uh, uh, um, a metaphor that we like in German, like ein, ein Schwamm, because it took many different cultures like it, it, many different cultures entered and languages. If we look at the, the map here today, um, 
we can see uh, it, it doesn't look that uh, heterogeneous as it actually is. Also, uh, because uh, the map is more than problematic. Uh, on the one hand, there are many minorities missing, and my colleague uh, Maxim Makartsev, of course, would now point out uh, that uh, some are completely missing, um, like the Armenians, the Meglano Romanians, so mostly these Balkan minority, Balkan Romans minorities that we find most of all. Um, again, I hope you see my cursor here uh, in the in Macedonia, North Macedonia. Um, but also like in, in the Greek, Greek parts, we would find them. Um, they're missing on the map. We also see that to a certain degree, the map is more than problematic because it mixes not only ethnic, linguistic, but also um, uh, religious uh, groups. So we see, for example, on the one hand, Albanians, but at the same time, also Muslims, uh, which they put here in yellow, where they mean actually that there are speaker of uh, the Stokavian varieties in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina and in Serbia, but also here, um, uh, here in Montenegro, uh, the map is much complex. And if we look actually at the at the Balkans, we can often uh, find incredible cases of multilingualism. Um, Maxim Makartsev has talked about it two years ago. I don't know whether any of the students attended it already back in the day, uh, but it's a beautiful presentation that you can still watch on, on YouTube, uh, where yeah, I can actually see on the one hand that there is there are intense intensive ties or strong ties between uh, linguistic groups to a certain degree also to um, religious uh, minorities and others. Um, a beautiful case uh, that we could mention here, of course, is uh, Ohrid, uh, where you can not only find, you can find uh, Albanian minorities, you can uh, at the same time also find uh, uh, Romanian groups, uh, speakers, native speakers, and also uh, some of the Balkan Turkish minorities, which I'm very interested in, in which are often considered these Rumeli uh, speakers. Uh, so where you can find four to five different linguistic groups and also different uh, religion groups, which coexist with each other um, in and to a certain degree, to a different extent, uh, uh, extent uh, in contact with each other. So um, we see this patchwork rock and this patchwork rock is uh, to a certain degree the result of many emigration uh, waves that we had into the Balkans. Uh, of course, we can mention the first or the in the third millennium BC, the Greek tribes, um, or which we, we also know they, they must have been in contact with other civilizations before. That's why we find in Greek certain uh, words that are not in the European origin, like Thalassa, uh, but also others. Um, we then have in the second century uh, before Christ, uh, the Roman uh, conquest, uh, the Romans conquest of, of the Balkans uh, with settlements. We then have in the sixth and seventh century, uh, the settlement of the Slavs. We have in the seventh also um, the immigration of Turkic tribes, the Bulgars, but also like others. Uh, and we have the Hungarian conquest in uh, the ninth century. We have German settlers. We have then after the fall of Constantinople and uh, up already before, to be honest, but the strongest immigration waves then are after the fall of Constantinople in 1453, um, where this Turkish migration uh, also starts. With, when you see Turkish, the difference between Turkic and Turkish should be important because, as I said, the Bulgars as a Turkic tribe, even though we have to be honest, we do not have that much linguistic data on the Bulgars. And uh, yeah, but we, we see there were many different uh, migrational waves which have led uh, to, on the one hand to a patchwork that we find in the Balkans, which is uh, interesting, which also has often been idealized mostly in the Western uh, civilization. Um, I will come back to this again when we talk about the Ottoman situation. Um, what we also see at the same time, it's in, this is interesting for the region, um, there uh, were many foreign centers and empires which had an impact on cultural, linguistic, but also religious questions in the Balkans. Uh, these um, empires and centers were mostly around the Balkans. So it's not like in other regions of the world where they also had own centers that started like expanding outside. Here was most of all centers from the outside that expanded within the Balkans. Um, we have, as I already mentioned, on the one hand, the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, the Habsburgs or the Austria-Hungarian Austria Empire, which expanded in it, in it, the Venetians, 
only to a certain degree, then of course the most well-known, the Ottoman Empire, and then also to a certain degree, the Russian Empire. And these empires had their impact on, 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 on different political questions, and they were of a huge uh, importance also for, for, for this patch, patchwork rock. Um, uh, now, if we come to the most, definitely one of the most important ones, um, mostly in the linguistic, linguistic view, more or less, it's the Ottoman Empire. It's one of the most uh, strongest influence on the region because the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Ottoman Empire was uh, of over 200 or around 500 years. It's also often like uh, we have this metaphor of the yoke. We find it most of all in the Bulgarian uh, nationalist movement, this, this vision of the yoke. Um, and what is important here is um, we have this uh, province, like the Balkans were often also ca called the Rumelia Eilat, um, which uh, consisted of modern day Albania, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Bulgaria, Greece, Kosovo, the Republic of North Macedonia, Serbia, and the Turkish territories. Um, but we also have to be honest, I, I think you also had the presentation, right, on, on the question of, of the, the presence of the, the Turkish or Ottoman presence in the region. Um, that this this presence was not identical in all the regions and there were huge differences between certain centers um and uh it's even much more complex to actually know what was going on there's still a lot going to to be studied and then there's another problem of course again there is um uh mostly uh, a div division between what is going on in turkey on this on the research on this region what was going on differences and everything and the european vision and um, or European is wrong. I would rather say like the vision in the national in the national states in the Balkans and also in Western Europe, of course. Um, the name itself, uh, as you know, uh, is Rumelia is of is used actually for for comes from Rome, but actually was used for the Byzantine Empire, often also like just for anything Greek, actually by the Ottomans. That's also why I think the Pontic Greek also are like uh, often called just Rum. By the Turkish uh, majority, uh, at least um, speakers from from uh, Ankara told me they consider everything Greek just room with it Greek within uh, Turkey. Um, the region actually was really important, crucial uh, for uh, the finances of the Ottoman Empire in the in that time. But at the same time, this uh, Ottoman rule had also a huge impact on the entire region, in the sense that on the one hand, uh, this cultural, religious, linguistic patchwork to a certain degree survives due to the presence of the, of the Ottoman Empire. And, but also at the same time, um, what is important, these nationalist movements that we find in Europe already quite early in the, the 17th century, they start uh, in German speaking, uh, in in French speaking, in the modern way, we also already have them a little bit earlier. Uh, in the case of Italy, the question, the Italian question, already starts in the 13th, 14th century with uh, Dante, Petrarca, and the others. Um, but what we see in the Balkans at the same time, this question, this national question, is actually quite late in comparison to other regions. Uh, what we also see is um, a huge difference in the industrialization processes and so changes within the social structures, which in the in the other parts of Europe actually are much earlier than in the Balkans in comparison to this. Often this is uh, uh, explained with the Ottoman rule. It is much more complex if we want to be honest. It is much more uh, difficult. What we can still say is that um, this view of the Balkans has been really strong. In, uh, mostly in Western Europe. This is also why in, in many uh, theories, often um, it is, con many, many theorists ex uh, compare the Balkans to, to Asia, not European. It was often just straight away, straight away excluded from anything European. We also have find this in uh, early um, social theories uh, from also from communist movements, which, uh, argued that the Balkans, for example, would not be ready for any communist movement because the, their social structures were, would, to, would be too much Asian, which of course is a racist, racist view and which is dangerous. But this view actually of the Balkans as backwards, as everything, uh, or in, or originates most of all from, from this Western view on the Balkans. Um, 
this is why actually also we can see in the in the case of the Balkan varieties and in the, both the Balkan uh, nationalist movements that this distancing themselves uh, from the Balkans was actually important. We see this in the case of Romania, where uh, this idealization of every anything French is really strong within the nationalist movement and this uh, trying to purify the language from every anything Turkish uh, was uh, really, really crucial. Uh, even changing names. So we, we find this uh, in the most important writers from Romanian li uh, literature, like Eminescu, who clearly changed his name uh, because of, of nationalist ideas. Um, so what, what, of course, in Western Europe is, is strong is this view then um, uh, the Balkans as the powder keg or like, uh, to, um, yeah, we, we have different translation for that. Uh, and these national national movement, and we we see here also um, that this this is the only thing normally we in Western Europe know about the Balkans. So like there was this Balkan Wars. We don't know what what these Balkan Wars were. We often also like to say the First World War started because of that. And actually, our view is just this. Um, what we um, can say is that um, the this entire positioning actually is quite much more difficult. And I think when we come back to these two videos that we had um, before from Zizek, we can see this Western view on the Balkans actually in the first video. Um, this is the question of West and the West and the Balkans. I will play it. And again, I, I think I will not hear it. I hope you will hear it at least. And if not, please tell me. Yes, we can okay. hear it. Okay, we can perfect. Begin. Okay. Now, what you see here is, at least in summer or in the fall, one of the nicest views of Ljubljana. It looks like Paris, green leaves, etc. On both sides, nice old houses, nothing special. Eh, but you are wrong. This river here is the official geographical limit between Balkan and Middle Europa. So, beware, on the other side, horror, oriental despotism, women get beaten, get raped and like it, on this side, Europe, civilization, women get beaten and raped, but don't like it. So, Balkan, Middle Europa, don't forget it. Yes. Um, uh, Zizek, and most of all, Zizek's beautiful um, English pronunciation. Yes, this, this view, actually, this Asian despotism is what I mentioned before. Um, this is a view which was most of all within uh, German um, early communist uh, tradition, which was propagated by them. So this Asian despotism, uh, this view of the of the Balkans uh, being not Europe, um, was was uh, already there. That we could see, we could already see it in earlier stages, of course. And we see here the the one of the big issues when we talk about the Balkans, actually. So um, the problem always of Balkan being viewed pejorative, Balkan being uh, uh, viewed as non-civilized. We will also see this actually when we talk about the question of the Balkan languages and the problem of the Balkan languages. Um, this, this view has been strong. Uh, and we um, could talk here about ours. There's also a, a beautiful book by Todorova about this uh, concept of, of the Balkans. Um, which takes many of these questions into account. Uh, and also, actually, as I said before, the problem then, these languages often, mostly in, uh, it depends on, on, on the view, but in, within the Rome, Romanian stance, actually, is this attempt not to be too Balkan or not to just to distance themselves actually from anything Balkan. So I don't know if you have any questions till now. Um, other or comments, please feel free. Otherwise, I, I will continue. I just have to do it like that. Are there any questions from the students till now, or should we continue? Feel free to ask or to say or to mention. Ребята, есть ли какие-то вопросы? Пока. Никто ничего пока не хочет спросить. Пока что нет. Пока что нет, спасибо. Окей, okay, хорошо. Окей, okay, let's continue then. Well, the question of the Balkan Sprachbund. So, um, well, I always have to take this uh, citation uh, by Freeman and Joseph from 2017. 
um, as I mentioned before, the Balkans um, are always uh, admired for the linguistic diversity and for language contact or contact between different cultures uh, because as viewed as a cultural, linguistic and religious sponge. Um, if we go to linguistics, then um, this citation here from Friedman and Joseph actually is really true. Uh, I cite, it is impossible to talk about the Balkans from a linguistic standpoint and not to utter uh, the term Sprachbund, end of citation. Uh, we will discuss it uh, now. Actually, what um, what does it mean? Uh, most of all, this idea of we have so many forms, uh, we have different languages, but structures which look so similar. So this idea is not new. It's even though the citations, this, these here two here are from the last 20 years, this idea of uh, a Balkan Sprachbund of uh, idea of this co language contact and the impact of language contact between these varieties is actually quite old for, for a linguistic standpoint, because we can already find in uh, 1829 in uh, Yeme Kopitar's uh, description, we can uh, already find this idea of uh, a Sprachbund, which then will be defined later, but this idea of of parallelisms between these varieties. Uh, so Kopitar uh, said, I, I put it in, in uh, German because maybe you like it to read it in German. Um, he said from the Bukovina, which is um, in the north of uh, Romania, uh, to, this, uh, to the Pindus in the south, which I think here everybody knows, from the Adriatic Sea in the, in, in the oh, sorry, in the west it should be, and the Black Sea in the east, uh, there is only, in German, nur eine Sprachform herrscht, aber mit dreierlei Sprachmaterie. Um, so in English, uh, he would say there's only one language form, but with three different language materials. So this example that we find here, this idea of even though we have different words, actually the structure, this idea, the form actually is the same. So uh, this idea originated in 2098, uh, 29, uh, which is uh, quite early for modern day linguistics, if we if we think about it. Um, it um, this idea has been really crucial in the entire field, but also for uh, the study of language contact in general. So Kopitar had this view, Jene Kopitar as a Slovene uh, linguist working in Vienna uh, was proposing this idea uh, that actually the Romanians and the Albanians uh, were something like brothers or neighboring people, uh, where like both actually had this thraco illyrian uh, origin. And while the Albanians uh, kept everything, the material and the form, the Romanians then would have accepted this for, uh, this material, like the language from the, from the Ro Romans, but then uh, would have keep the form and would have given that to the Slavic. We now, Nowadays, take a little different stance on this question. We uh, we are much more skeptic about it um, because, first of all, we don't know how the situation looked like. Uh, there are many parallelisms between uh, Albanian and Romanian. This is for sure, but we have to be uh, much more careful, and we cannot prove anything. Um, so that's also as I write here. We don't know about the source, uh, but this uh, interest uh, for the parallels that we find in the different languages. In the case of uh, Kopitar, it's, it, he gives this example, but actually he always talks only about three languages. Actually he always talks about Albanian, which he calls Alban Albanesish, Albanes Albanesish, yes, uh, Rom Valachian for Romanian and Bulgarian, which is not clear what he actually means. Um, so we, we, know, we see there this, this focus on these three languages. And this idea then, was all over um, most of all German speaking, uh, but also different, uh, let's just say, linguistics in the German speaking world. It also then got into other spheres, but it was most of all there. And we also see different linguists then actually picking up this idea of the Balkan languages being so much different. So, so, so. It, we will see Ilbret actually for for linguists. We have uh, Schleicher, which is for the German tradition actually really important. 
uh, which uh, often uh, took these Balkan varieties as uh, corrupted and tried to show what happens in uncivilized, uh, in his opinion, uncivilized um, uh, regions. Uh, so you again have the German citations. Uh, what, uh, what we can say here is uh, he tries to point out that uh, these Balkan varieties, again, Romanian, Albanian, and uh, uh, Bulgarian, uh, would then be the corrupted sons of their families, like his ill-bred sons. Uh, he uh, even says uh, then, like that, they are for the, the the what he calls Valachian is for the, is the ill-bred son of the Romans family, Bulgarian for the Slavic, and then the Albanian for the Greek, which we also know, which is not true. Uh, that uh, Albanian actually is a known um, a known group. Um, but this idea of of anything in the Balkans being corrupted, being different, and uh, like having come together, this has been really strong. And then uh, we see in the modern day uh, linguistics actually that uh, this idea of of the Sprachbund was then uh, uttered first uh, by uh, Trubetskoy, uh, a Russian linguist, um, um, who actually did not want to focus too much on the case of the Balkans. It is actually beautiful because it's two pages uh, that we have from it, but we have a huge discussion because uh, linguists then accused him of not specifying what he actually meant. But in my opinion, uh, the problem is mostly that we want actually more information that is there in the text. Uh, what Trubetskoy tried to, to uh, establish is a distinction between what we can say a phylogenetic tree, like languages we know that share similarities because they are related, and languages which share similarities that are not because they are related. And this is why he introduced this term Sprachbund. Uh, I gave you twi uh, two citations there, two years, because actually Trubetskoy first published it in 1923 in Russian, but uh, the Western world um, was not able to understand it. It got, did not get to the public, but then in 93, actually many in the West also got it. Um, well, uh, my, my, um, Supervisor would now say every good linguist has to speak some Russian. So that's why I have to work on my Russian also. So what happened then is this idea of the Sprachbund has been all over the place. It, um, if we, for example, look at modern day uh, linguistics, we can see that uh, this idea of Sprachbund can be found in uh, Thomas and Kaufman, Eichenwald, Dixon, Matras, and everybody. And everybody says, this is a Sprachbund. And or like there we have a Sprachbund. So we more or less at the moment, I think there's a beautiful uh, summary by Campbell, which talks about around 30 uh, alleged Sprachbünde. Uh, but the beautiful thing is that it's actually when, when you look for the definition, they often come back just to the bulk and say, this is the prototypical case there. As you also see it where like in different citations here, um, where they always come back to the Balkans as the prototypical Sprachbund. Um, and now, oh yeah, now it's working. Uh, yes, and just to give you a, a view uh, on that, actually, Trubetskoy just wanted to focus on the similarities that we find uh, between varieties. So in uh, Trubetskoy, I just took it here, again in German and then in English for you to as uh, a translation. Um, he, he just uh, tries to tell like what is the difference. And he says, for example, a language can be part of both on the one hand of a Sprachfamilie, a language family, and at the same time of a Sprachbund. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, the, the, the ones of you that speak German, they realized uh, actually uh, Sprachbund is not, a, is not uh, an English word, but it's a German word. The problem there also is that uh, Trubetskoy in his text, he used mostly, uh, he, he used uh, um, a translation from the Russian word. So we have this Yesika uh, voice Sayus, and um, this has also caused many problems. We will discuss this later because actually what a Sprachbund means and what it should look like, this was never specified by Trubetskoy. Uh, but since this this entire concept had such a strong position and is so well spread, um, some linguists have even argued that every linguist has a different uh, definition or a, a different view on, on it. 
what we can say, however, is that this idea by Trubetskoy, but also the studies by Sandfeld uh, and uh, Selishchev, there and, and also Weigand, even though it's not that much on that actually, uh, they have they have led to an, an, a plethora of studies. So what we can see is after this idea of of the uh, of the uh, of, after the like more or less formulation of this idea of a Sprachbund is that many linguists have uh, worked on the one hand on the languages, but also most of all uh, on this idea of a Sprachbund. They have looked for these phenomena. So um, we have here a small list. We could give you much more names. It's a it's a huge list. Um, of, of linguists who have worked, who have discussed, and who have um, looked for phenomena. Uh, this is, for example, from Tomic, um, which is from 2006, uh, which gives, for example, a list of features which often by linguists have been proposed uh, as balkanisms. This is the idea of a balkanism is a feature that according to the linguist is typical of Balkan languages. And it's also highly problematical. Um, on the one hand, um, I will come back to this because there is an argumentative circularity, um, most of all in the case, um, how we have to define them. Um, what we can also say, of course, in that moment is the problem of the um, focus on the one hand. So uh, if we look at the, the the things that they have, they work with a list with pluses. So actually the focus is often on what is there and not what is missing maybe also. So the focus is like to find a feature and say, this is this is a Balkanism. This is, this is typical for the Balkans. And uh, we will come back to this later. So, and uh, what happened with the languages? So I said, Kopita, started with this idea of um, the three languages, uh, Ro uh, Romanian, called Valachian, uh, with Bulgarian and um, Albanian. Well, the list has increased. And the problem with the list of what is Balkan uh, is also a huge subject which has been discussed uh, within li Balkan linguistics, but also all outside of the Balkans. So for example, Freeman and Joseph in their uh, article in 2017, but also in, as far as I, I remember in the book, um, they are to publish uh, soon. Um, they propose the following list. Uh, they say Albanian, Greek, the South Slavic languages, Bulgarian, Macedonian, and some dialects of Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian, Montenegrin, BCMS complex. The Eastern Romans languages are Romanian, Romanian, and Meglino Romanian, the co territorial dialects of the Indic language Romani, and to some extent the co uh, territorial dialects of Judesmo, brought to the Bal Ottoman Balkans by Jews expelled by the Iberian Peninsula, and Turkic, especially West Romanian and Gagauz are part of the Balkan Sprachbund. Um, well, as I already mentioned before, the problem here, are the problems are manifold. On the one hand, the problem is that um, we could ask why these varieties, why exactly these varieties, um, are these act are they actually um, linguistic, really linguist linguistic um, criteria used here? And then we could ask why not other varieties? Um, I don't know whether there, I think nobody from your studies Roman linguistics. For example, for me as a Romanist, most striking thing is that Eastern Romanian is not on the list. Um, they, for example, uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph and Friedman, they discussed this question then with difference between languages of the Balkans and Balkan languages. So they say there are languages in the Bal languages in the Balkans can be any language that is in the Balkans. And Balkan languages are the ones that are have these typical Balkan features. Well the problem there is uh, of course well what how you define them and uh, how you come to these uh, list of, of features. Um, and the other problem is, of course, that uh, some linguists which highly uh, disagree on their language being Balkan, they fight against this. So there's mostly in the Romanian linguistics, there's uh, the, the biggest names of Romanian linguistics have often fought against this classification. Uh, Pushkariu, uh, Kapidan and others have always pointed out that Romanian is not Balkan, it is a Romans language. They often pointed out, well, a Romanian and the others, they might be, but 
of course, Dhaka Romanian is not Balkan. We are not part of the Balkan Sprachbund or anything. They said there is something like a Balkan Sprachbund, but of course, their languages were not part. So this is there has always been a huge uh, discussion on all of this, and um, the, the the main problem I have always turn around certain uh, questions, like as I mentioned before, like how do we have to imagine such a thing like a Sprachbund? Because as I said, in the end, uh, the focus by Nikolai Trubetskoy has been on finding or explaining parallelisms and not defining an entire concept. And um, what we find is on the one hand, different uh, um, uh, first terms for something like uh, a Sprachbund. They're like uh, terms like linguistic area, convergence area that we find in linguistics, but nobody actually really could provide a good example, like, or could not, not a good example, because in the end, it's always the Balkans, the prototypical example, but they could not explain what are actually, what is needed to have a Balkan, uh, to, to a Sprachbund. Uh, um, then, on the other hand, um, there has, as I already mentioned, a discussion on the features uh, that should be considered Balkans, uh, or also uh, the members. So, like, what does it mean to be a member of of something like a Sprachbund? Uh, what is what does it mean to be uh, to to which degree can a language be member? Do all have to have the same position? There are many questions that within linguistics are always discussed, and uh, the main question, which always actually, and this is a problem of the discipline, in my opinion, maybe Maxim Makartev will not agree with me, is that the focus has often been on. Uh, synchronic parallelisms, but the question actually is, uh, where do these features come from? And uh, in the case of the Balkans, we can see that Kopitar, uh, as I mentioned, had this substrate idea. Uh, uh, Sandfeld, for example, had this superstrate super uh, idea, most of all with Greek. We will come back when we talk about the Greek. And then uh, in the case of others, there was this idea of intense, multilateral, multidirectional, mutual and multi. Um, a mutual multilingualism, which also then would be a question of how can we actually um, more or less uh, verify something like that in the past is much more complex than maybe thought. And this is why uh, there have also been some critics. Um, on the one hand, uh, many have pointed out, even within Balkan linguistics, that the problem of this study is that there is a certain uh, argumentative circularity um why well actually if, when you when you start from within the field maybe you don't realize it but it's it is a problem because when you define balkanisms um what you define actually is something that you find in languages that you define to be to to that you can uh, assume to be part of something so you say I find in these languages, in this area, this phenomenon. So this is a typical phenomenon of them. And then I just consider the languages which also have this feature. If I then, for, if I would say, no, well, my, I take this variety in there too, then I, I maybe come up with a completely different result. So um, that's why uh, some like Stolz and Gardani et al. have uh, fought against uh, this idea of this concept of of a Sprachbund. We could still like argue. Well, even though we don't know what it is, we can continue uh, with the research. But of course, there is this this stance, and uh, it it might be interesting also to to reflect about these questions. So, um, if there are no questions till here, I just continue with uh, the position of. Greek with it, within all of this. So just because you have this um, interest in Greek language, uh, yes. Should I continue or any questions? I think there will be questions after you continue with the Greek language. Oh, uh, after, okay, so uh, let's continue. Well, well, um, yeah, the Greek language within all this, um, I mean, the first one to actually uh, also consider uh, Greek within this question of the Balkan languages or the Balkans uh, was uh, Franz von Miklosic, uh, who continued the N.A. Kopitar's uh, research on the Balkan languages, also on different aspects. He's also really well known within Slavistics. He has also studied uh, Romanian or like Romans varieties. Um, also, uh, if there are any Slovenists in here, they will of course know him because he was of crucial importance for this uh, Slo for Slovene and Slovene literature. Um, 
And he was the first one actually to uh, include Greek in this entire uh, idea of the Balkans and the Balkan languages. Um, he uh, elaborated also a list of autochthonous, according to him, autochthonous elements in the languages. Again, here, um, uh, Mikosic uh, had this idea of a substrate, which also was folk, uh, was which was already um, uttered by uh, Kopitar. Uh, this in his uh, point was it, it was the Thraco-Illyrian substrate. Again, problematic because we don't have that much data, neither on Illyrian nor on Thracian. And he mentioned these four typical phenomena, according to him, for Balkan languages. Uh, so one is the future with want, um, one is the lack of uh, infinitives replaced by finite verbs preceded by a conjunction, uh, then the merger of genitive and dative, uh, the un-Romans postposing of definite articles. Um, well, on the one hand, this list, um, th this is these are the typical features that we always find when, when we talk about Balkan languages. Uh, we also have, um, I think, most studies on, on actually any of these four features. Um, we also see actually that Greek already here is not uh, completely uh, within the picture. What happens is then in um, 1930, uh, actually, again, the book was published first in Danish, actually uh, did not reach many uh, uh, linguists, then published in French in 1930, that's why uh, normally we cite this book um, is by Sandfeld and Sandfeld uh, took up this idea of these four varieties, which should be considered um, uh, Balkan varieties. Um, here uh, in Sandfeld, interesting, Sandfeld does not um, consider Trubetskoy. So this idea is this idea of the Balkan Sprachbund and Sandfeld's study. They, they have a lot of parallelisms, but they do not uh, take into uh, uh, they do not consider each other. Um, we see uh, that Sandfeld had this view of Greek being a uh, part of, of something uh, of the Balkans, but most of all, he tried to explain anything within the Greek language um, or like what we find in the other languages due to Greek uh, domination of the others. This most uh, uh, strongest uh, points were most of all the the thousands of year, according to him, domination of the Orthodox Church and uh, the, the domination of the Byzantine Empire, which nowadays often is also uh, viewed, uh, uh, viewed with a quite, let's say, a skeptical view, because we know that uh, the Greek language had an impact on these varieties. We know that Greek texts appeared in, uh, in Slavic speaking regions and in Roman speaking regions like in Romania, Wallachia, but how much actually these texts had like an impact on the sp languages spoken is to be discussed. But for Sandfeld, this view was clear. Most of all, this, this, this again, this more or less view from the of the Balkans, like as this pejorative view of the Balkans, where only the cultural language Greek could have had an impact on the others, um, was uh, propagated. Um, as I say, uh, as I hear right here, there's there are many discussions. There are um, views that say Greek must have had a central uh, position within these varieties. There are others which say it had either a, per a much peripheral uh, role in the entire Sprachbund. Um, but actually, there are still many questions to to be uh, discussed and to be studied. Most of all, as I mentioned before, the diachronic view. Uh, and this is, uh, on the one hand, quite problematic because actually we do not have that many linguistic data from the majority of these languages. We have, of course, for Greek, uh, a huge number of data. Uh, we have from the Slavic rights to a certain degree with Church Slavonic, which uh, we also have to be honest. It is much more problematic when we work with these data because on the one hand, uh, colleagues of mine have worked with it, uh, Ivan Shimko, for example, which have pointed out that many of these structures often are straight translations from Greek. We have worked on a uh, translation of Alexander the Great stories, I'd, like adapted versions, where, for example, you can see one-to-one -one where a Greek word or 
entire Greek construction is translated into Slavic. Um, so this is uh, much more problematic. So actually, from a, from my point of view, um, there will be we would need much more um, to uh, to study much more these questions. Um, what we can see is or say is like Greek often is in these lists. Uh, we have I took here two examples. Uh, I'm quite sure you could take any other uh, um, study because they're always lists. And uh, we can see here, for example, even in Jokolinstedt study, Greek is in there. Uh, here in uh, Tomic study, it's under MG, modern Greek. Um, where they try to, to show these features that we find in the languages. Now, what is the problem with these lists? Um, these lists, again, are studies of the modern languages on the one hand. So we find uh, a list, we say, I find this in modern Greek, I find this in, uh, here we have uh, AR, a Romanian, that's it, we have this, that, that's done, it's perfect. But the problem here is much more much more problematic, uh, uh, was much more deeper in within the entire field. On the, on the one hand, the question is like, why do I choose these features? So why do I say that these uh, enclitics art, enclitic articles or post post articles are a feature? And uh, we could then also ask, um, why actually um, do we only work with pluses? What I mentioned before, is it just is it just that features that we find are there? And uh, isn't, isn't it also interesting what we don't find maybe in this region? And then on the other hand, again, uh, the diachronic view is completely out of the picture. I mean, for certain features, we can say, we can observe within Greek history, the same evolution as in the Slavic varieties. Um, and then we can, uh, maybe it's good to come to the next, to some features under the scope. And maybe, maybe, I've discussed the, these and then we can just uh, have the questions. Um, so if we, for example, go what we have here in the list was um, this Volo future or will future. Volo is just from uh, Latin. Um, we can go to the languages. And if this is one of the most discussed features that we find in these languages, this uh, future built with uh, what they call volo or velle within Romans, actually we would use velle, not volo, um, or yeah, this will future, which we also find in other languages of the world, actually in quite many. Um, it, we could just take all these languages, all these synchronic features and then say, okay, I find in uh, Greek, the zulevo, well, we could also discuss why this, like, like this and not the other form, uh, we find in Romanian also, uh, we find in in Albanian dote punoi that's perfect. Everything is with want. Uh, actually, uh, if we are more uh, let's say more uh, skeptical about anything like that, we should also be honest that the situation is not the same. Maybe because if we go for uh, sa in uh, in uh, in Greek and o in Romanian, these. Uh, these uh, forms, at least to my knowledge, are opaque to a native speaker. So uh, a Romanian, at least a Romanian speaker, a native speaker of modern day Romanian does not recognize this form or as a form of, of uh, Vreau. Then the same, as far as I know, is, the same, is true for Greek. So my, I, my Greek native speakers I'm in contact with, they did not know that Sa and Thelo is, are like in any way related. This is not true uh, in the case of uh, Albanian, actually. Um, it is true, again, for Macedonian, uh, like Macedonian here, and for Bulgarian. Then, of course, we also have to be honest in another way. These are not maybe the only forms, actually, that we find in these languages, because in the case of Romanian, we have a second and even a third uh, construction where we have uh, voi, which is uh, clear to a native speaker. This is a this this is also in in many dialects used just as a full form of of the want construction uh, and an infinitive. Uh, we also have it in in BCMS. Uh, now this is uh, from we could now say well from if we go from a synchronic stance it is problematic. We could still then say well. Well, here we can say we have diachronic data on many of these varieties, and we can see how this process slowly goes 
from um, Greek, where we can see it quite early, also in Romanian, then slowly. Uh, for example, in the case of Bulgarian, in uh, texts from 18th century, 19th century, we can still see that this form was actually uh, inflected. We can see that this form was in in um, in coexistence with a full form and everything. So we can observe this. But the problem is saying just well, in the, these languages like that is quite problematic because it is not just simple. It's not simple as that. We have a lot of variation. We have a lot of different movements, and we will come to this in the next slide. It's the same. Uh, we had this uh, when we go to um, here now. The question of in the list uh, here, if we go to the list, this dative genitive merging, which is of is, is called a, in Tomic. Uh, we also have it like uh, well, here's dative possessive merging. We also have. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, he does not include it. But in the case of Tomic, you can say, well, dative genitive merging. Now, um, this uh, is true um, to a certain degree, because on the one hand, if we go uh, to Romanian, we can see that Tomic has a beautiful list here saying that, well, in the end, what dative is used uh, for for this construction, the possessive construction, and the dative is used uh, for uh, the indirect object in A, A2. And we can see that in many of these languages, uh, this works. But if we are honest, um, it is not just that these merged, but also in which direction they merged. So if we go from a diachronic stance, we can say that in uh, the case of Romanian, it's actually the dative that took over all the functions of the genitive, because this lui is the dative form in Latin that we can observe. And this is clear within Roman, Romanian uh, linguistics uh, that this is a dative. Now, um, what, however, is the case in Greek, and uh, there you know it much better than I do, in the case of Greek, actually, it is not, uh, not the case. We have, we have, um, in the case of Greek, actually, the genitive that took over the, the functions of the dative, we have also in in in, uh, in Greek within Greek much more variety actually because we do not only have um, the the this this dative or like this genitive that that it works as a dative that then is used for indirect object. We also have different constructions, uh, which are actually much more similar to what we find in modern day Romans languages, like this to, to somebody construction. Um, so actually saying it is like that in these varieties, it's not it's not easy. It is much more complex than, than often assumed. This is also the case when we, this is just to have some examples that I really like to, to show always to, to argue for that point. Um, with um, non-infinitive -infin -infin constructions, because it is true that in many of these languages you have uh, constructions where no, in like non-inflected form is used. Um, but in the case of Romanian, for example, we also have to mention that there is an infinitive. Now you see here that Tomic in this argumentation has used uh, this bell. Uh, this first singular that we know actually also from Greek. You have it here in the trans transliterated form. But actually, as I mentioned before, this is not the only construction. We also have a kunta in Romanian, which is an infinitive, which in certain constructions can show up. So what, what is the problem here is that you can use anything for any argumentation. It's um, you find these parallels, yes, but uh, then critics of any this, of these theories will come up with the with the opposite. So if you come with these well non uh, with this uh, this uh, non existence of non finite forms in Romanian, a Romanian linguist will immediately come with the in uh, the infinitive construction, which is there. So actually, it is much more, um, we should be much more careful how we describe and actually ask ourselves also, how is it possible that we come to these constructions? And then here, this is an example um, or many examples from, from my um, PhD thesis. Um, um, this is um, the question of differential location marking or like location direction marking uh, that we can observe. 
And um, the problem here in these examples, we've actually find many of the problems we are facing when we study uh, the languages of the Balkans or the Balkan languages. Actually, I tend to always use uh, languages of the Balkans to not get into any troubles. Um, what we know from Greek uh, is that uh, in the case of location direction marking, um, the, the, the drop of any, any um, uh, direction marking is possible. So Pao Athena actually, or Pao Scholio is uh, quite frequently within Greek. Um, what is uh, interesting uh, is that when we go to the Romans languages, um, the, here we have, uh, Arama this is uh, our Romanian variety from Turia Crania in Greece. We can see that this variety does the same to a certain degree. So we can say in uh, the Armenian variety of this location, Yeram Filati, which actually is the Greek word, which in any other Romans language would sound really weird. It's uh, really difficult to say we are in prison without, uh, without any preposition, at least in the Daco Romans, in the other Armenian varieties. What we, however, can see in other Armenian varieties, this one is from Khrushchevo, is that uh, we have different lo location marking with uh, city names, which we also find uh, in um, in uh, Turia Crania. So they would clearly distinguish, they would say in the prison with a preposition, but when they talk about Skopje or Bitola, they can use it without any, any preposition. So uh, the construction here would be Sigura Tora Vas Shidam Skopje. So, um, which, uh, which we, I would certainly stay in Skopje now. Uh, Tora also from Greek, of course, uh, you know this. Um, and this construction is completely fine. Then, then we come to the next problem, the question of uh, Arbresh in that moment, Arbresh, an Albanian variety in Italy, uh, where we can observe the same tendency. So in Gerbino's uh, grammar of uh, uh, Piana degli Albanesi, uh, he describes uh, the same phenomena. So like he says, but Rome, uh, she went to Rome or he went ri Palerm. Um, he is in Palerm or arrived there. Yeah. I think he translated it with uh, is be, but yeah. Um, so what we can see is certain features are not only at features are, are like not always identical on the one hand, on the other hand, we can see, we can also see it in features which are not in the Balkans. There, of course, with Arbresh, we could ask ourselves, why is it? Is it a feature that was borrowed from, from already before? Is it a feature that was um, borrowed when it was in Italy? Because we also know that there is a Greek population in Southern Greece, uh, in Southern Italy. And uh, Piano degli Albanesi, however, is quite far away from there. But what we can see actually is, it is much more complex. And saying some features are just Balkanisms is problematic because when we find it outside, some might argue, well, this is not, um, it is not just a Balkanism, it can happen in many languages. What therefore is important is actually to go into detail and be sure what we describe is uh, much, or, much more or less uh, clear. So um, these were like some features or like questions that I want to discuss and then just some final remarks and then you can ask your questions and I hope I guess there will be some um, and I hope I will be able to answer them. Uh, what we can say is um, on the one hand there are a number of parallelisms in the uh, Balkan languages or languages of the Balkans uh, but we have to be uh, honest many times we focus on synchronic parallelisms which is also due to the question of language att attestation uh, we should also be careful of oversimplifications um, so that we actually describe what is there. And I mean, also in the case of the Greek varieties within the Balkans, we should also ask ourselves whether um, it we, we shouldn't also like ask questions about other uh, Greek varieties um, and whether their features could be of interest. Uh, we should be careful with certain biases. This is what I mentioned before, uh, the, the problem with the languages in the Balkans or like the view on the Balkans, this view of exotic, which is also uh, mentioned by Aronson, but also by others. Um, this this view that anything in the Balkans must be completely different, must be completely weird. 
but also that in our own research background, because of course, uh, when I focus, when I come from a certain tradition, certain features are for me more uh, obscure and much more interesting or weird. So we could also argue that some of these lists actually are problematic because they come from a per certain stance. Um, we know that within the Balkan studies, uh, Slavists, Slavists were the big majority, so we could ask ourselves, actually, wouldn't it be interesting also to focus on other varieties, like the Turkic varieties of the Balkans, which are often excluded or which are under research also to a certain degree, and uh, also ask ourselves uh, what is missing. So um, what I think still is there's uh, uh, still a lot to discover in the Balkans and many questions to be answered. And... Um, the, there are still many, many things to discuss on the Balkans and hopefully uh, overcome certain argumentative circularities. So this was it from my stance. Um, I hope everything was more or less clear. If not, now is the time to tell me. Thank you very much. So, you already wrote in the chat, right? Yeah, it was me, I think, and Maxim. Uh, Maxim. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is uh, just to 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 um to to Maxim's point. Yes, this is a point. I also wanted to mention that I still took the example. Um, where is it? Here, right? Uh, 41, yes. Yeah, it, there are errors in there. For example, also what I wanted to mention, um, uh, here, if we go to uh, Greek, for example, I, I think sa zulevo, yes, you can use it, but you can also actually different forms. This is like more than problematic. Sorry, but it's a question. So I could start with my... Yes. Uh, it, it, there are no questions, but there are some thoughts uh, about it. Mm -hmm. um, as I wrote you in the chat, uh, mm -hmm. I think that we have to uh, speak about dialects, uh, talking about Greek, the Greek standard language and the Greek dialects are different things. Uh, that's why when we are speaking about, for example, um, these tha forms in the future, in the simple future, and in all the types of the future. When you are talking about the Cypriot Greek, it is Ennapao, for example, and this uh, uh, tha goes to Enna, and it becomes more clear that it comes from Thelo Napao. Mm -hmm. Maybe there are some other varieties, dialect varieties, I don't, um, can, I cannot um, remember right now. But uh, the same uh, um, is right to all the other types uh, of Balkan, uh, Balkan uh, features in the Greek language. When we are talking about dialects, the situation is different. Mm -hmm. um, usually in all these Balkan linguistics researchers, uh, they use only the standard Greek. And when we are speaking about dialects, about northern dialects, for example, about um, eastern dialects, the situation is different. Yeah, I mean, Every time I mean, you have, have to deal with the dialects too, not only with the southern language. Yes, I mean, uh, as uh, just to to pick up that point, also Professor Sobolev has pointed out. Actually, we should focus on dialects in many many yeah. questions, and uh, this is true. I mean, we can also go to this question uh, i mean with differential location and direction marking so in modern day macedonian standard for example it is clear there is no distinction so you would say voskopie sum or odan voskopie but uh, if we go to the dialect actually this construction odan skopie or uh, skopie sum is much more frequent. So actually, on the one hand, the problem is when we focus on modern standards, uh, it's problematic. And on the other hand, we we often then like are, are facing other problems. In the case of Romanian, for example, uh, we know Romanian standard has been inspired heavily heavily by French. 
we know that certain i mean in within in the in the nationalist movement of romania uh, in the in the 19th century uh, we can see that one to one translations from french were built so actually this is much more problematic than when we go with with these examples so it, you're you're completely right it's it's problematic when we go with mod, with standards and it's uh, actually oversimplifying the problem is also as as i said sometimes people like to use certain um features as argumentation and this is this is the main problem and the other problem is let's be honest it is quite difficult to really have a deep knowledge in all these varieties so i can also to a certain degree understand that because uh, i have been facing the same problem i mean like as i said i'm first uh, most of all a romanist so working with a romanian already is like really really difficult and then having a deep knowledge of greek varieties of turkish varieties of albanian varieties of macedonian bulgarian and all these can be uh uh um, like a heraclean task <laughs> yeah. yeah and also i had another question about these uh, very examples you are showing us mm -hmm. you're translating right now yeah. uh, now that in greek it's not possible to use all the nouns with this construction yeah, mm -hmm. you can you can uh, only say pao skoleo ime spiti, pao filaki ime filaki, but pao athena it's not quite uh, common uh, like pao skoleo ime spiti. Mm -hmm. And there are some nouns you cannot use just with these constructions without prepositions. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, the number of these constructions you can use without prepositions is quite small. It's only definite uh, special words you can use without prepositions. And they have to um, um, have uh, some morphological definite features. For example, mm -hmm. it should be nouns of neutral or feminine gender when you cannot define, the dif there is no difference between accusative and nominative. It's mm -hmm. very difficult, almost um, impossible to use uh, uh, masculine nouns in these constructions and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. so that's why these examples are, uh, are okay. There is no um, problem with the power athena, power scholio. Power athena, I think um, you should, yes, just say that it's a common type of uh, a speaking standard, not a literal mm -hmm. standard of modern Greek, mm -hmm. but uh, also it is not um, how to say it is not the the syntactical uh, syntactical and morphological form standard form for for the modern. Mm -hmm. Greek. Yes. I don't know if my my, co my colleagues can agree with me. Mm -hmm. yes, you can yes. say ima Athena, but it's not regular. Mm -hmm. It's not standard for the syntax of this uh, type mm -hmm. of uh, sentence. Ima mm -hmm. Athena, Pau Horyo, but it's a little bit not standard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's also what, what I found. Um, I mean, uh, I mean, when we want to be honest about Scholio, we can be also skeptical because it's not only, I mean, Scholio is, has many it's not just like the it's not just a place but it's also an institution yeah. it's like in italian when you, when i say vado a scuola you, when there in italian it's clear for example I, for me that i grew up with italian vado a scuola means like i go to the institution like re, on a regular base but yeah. for example vado alla scuola means like i go to the the the, the building so actually it's much more complex and it's also we we could dare of course, when when I have Yiram Filaki, um, actually, I mean, this is this is uh, and maybe the, I guess this is an institution here, but there are like many many different things going on. Actually, it's the same um, with with uh, when we go to diff. I mean, it's not the same as here on the right, uh, where we really have this distinction. Unfortunately, I did not have enough space because I had so many examples for our Romanian and for um, our Resh. But where you have clearly, they just don't use it with names. Uh, I remember when we did uh, field work. Um, I'm not sure whether with my colleague Maxim Makartev or with uh, Anastasia Escher, um, where we played around with these sentences. Um, 
in, in the case of uh, Romanian, and they, they would accept uh, no like uh, preposition, but only with cities they know, like 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 or like the most important cities for them. So like the speaker would accept bitula, like the speaker would say miniescu scuplia, miniescu bitula, miniescu sorum, miniescu, and then of course Constantinople or Tarigrad. But then when we asked, so Miniescu, Miniescu Zirich, the speaker would not accept it because like the speaker said, ah, it's weird because I, I've never been to there. So like, I, I don't know what you mean. So it's, there's much more going on, I think. And just saying, well, it's like that in these varieties can be quite dangerous, as you said. And in the case of, of Greek, of course, we, it would be much more interesting to, to have much more data on the dialects and also like in, in, in any dialect, of course, but yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry, um, I think that uh, you forget about so-called so uh, functions of cases. If, for example, we take a uh, Latin language, we, ca we, can, we can say vado romam, which is locative. The same case, we have paus folio. Paus piti, it's locative. Imes piti, it's locative. Yeah, I mean, I mean, here we could we could have uh, other cases. Uh, I did field work with um, the Rumeli variety, like the Balkan Turkish varieties, in Ohrid, for example, where they. I mean, the question there is how fast can speakers actually adapt these these patterns? Because what I saw in Ohrid is that they do not distinguish location and direction anymore. They uh, straight take the structure from, from Macedonian and Albanian they were in contact with. So they would say, um, uh, now my favorite uh, example, uh, ben, ben Yim Pazarda, and they would say Ben Giderim Pazarda. So they do not distinguish it. In, in Turkish, it's clear one is with the, genit uh, with the dative, the other is with the loca loca locative. But what they do then, uh, they take this construction and they they just use the locative in all the cases. So what I then assumed was like, well, the native speaker of Rumeli, maybe they do not distinguish dative and uh, locative anymore. And what happened was like, they still use the dative, but they use the dative only with indirect objects. They don't use it with direction anymore. So there's so much going on actually in these varieties that is um, is to be considered. Uh, and and also uh, uh, the, the the semantics, uh, as you were mentioning before we lost you, the semantics of course are a huge factor. The question of frequency, in my opinion, also like if if a speaker has no relation to a place, why should should use it? It's like the same. We have also cases of differential location marking in Swiss German, but only with shops. I know. I mean, I can say Gömerkop which is slang a little bit. It's like funny youth slang, but I can only use it with a shop I have here. I don't use it with a, a shop I don't know. So it's, yeah, of course, there are many factors behind this that we would need to consider. Yeah, maybe Just, it, it is functionally, it's like a locative Edward. And it's, it works like an Edward. Mm, yeah. Yeah, like in the Slavic language. It begins no working as adverb because we 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 uh, show some place. We can say I go to supermarket. Pau supermarket, stylinka mm -hmm. in in Greek. Mm -hmm. I think um, we we should uh, give more uh, attention to our functions. Of cases, mm -hmm. yeah. Because um, in ancient languages, there were a lot of functions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, also as I said, in uh, in in Slavic languages, with the the word of home, house, uh, also in in Romans languages, a casa. In real in real reality, it's it, it's a casa is not a noun. We cannot say alla casa. Because then it would be something different. Of course, they're, they're like functions behind the the use of these. Uh, on the one hand, uh, nouns with 
uh, preposition and determination or without, uh, so they, they can be completely different. So yes. Okay. Are there any other questions? I guess Maxime will have a lot of questions and comments. <laughs> Afterwards. Yes. When we stop the recording. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have another one. Yes. Found the place of Greece in the Balkan um, map, in the mm -hmm. map of the Balkans. Uh, when uh, we see that Greece is not included into this Balkan state, uh, Balkan um, yeah, area, where does it belong then? <laughs> the good question. I mean, for I can also only say from my personal stance. Um, uh, it for us, it's Southern Europe. That's like it's it's always. I mean, also because um, uh, I have been in intense contact with Italy. Greece is always considered uh, a broader nation. And as I said, like this idea of the cradle of democracy and everything. Uh, so for, 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 for me, Greece was all, always Western Europe, like part of us. And I think we discussed this before. My colleagues, my friends from Albania, they were like really shocked when I said that because they said like, we, we are closer to Italy to a certain degree than, than, than Greece is. Like, we see Italy like from from our coast, all our coast, and um, yeah. So like, I think I think for us this, uh, I think you also see it with this question of EU. That like uh, with Greece, nobody had any objections integrating Greece in the in the EU in in Euro and everything. Well, of course, afterwards crisis and everything, there were discussion, but like our perception was always this and i mean it was interesting when i, I read in edgar hirsch's um book about the balkans uh, this this idea was propagated to a certain degree also by greek scholars um but yeah i mean you you mentioned that uh for example the russian view on greece is is different to a certain degree right um so it it, it is interesting like how, i mean slovenia for us is not considered and uh, i was in slovenia for the first time two years ago and i was surprised how how much slovenia looks like switzerland and austria and everything mm -hmm. so like it's really funny how these perceptions are are sometimes just weird we also discussed it with austria actually with colleagues because a colleague of mine is from vienna and we were like uh saying vienna part of the german-speaking world and everything and it's so close to us and then we realized that uh, it's mo it's 800 kilometers from Zurich to Vienna, but only 500 to Belgrade. And we were like, nobody would believe that, that, that Vienna is that far away. And it's like how our worldview is distorted to a certain degree. It's like funny. Yeah, no, I mean, so for us, it would be the West. Um, as, a, as it seems in the US, it's not. It is I, neither West nor East. Uh, but yeah, but yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, okay. And uh, do you have questions? Ja, ребята, есть ли еще вопросы? Вы можете тоже по-русски, если вы хотите. Нет, наверное, вопросов нет. Большое спасибо за лекцию. Очень интересно. Нужно это все просто переварить. Спасибо большое. Я знаю, что у меня, у меня есть еще один маленький вопрос. Не знаю, насколько э, Оливье не устал ли еще отвечать. А, нет, у меня время. А, хорошо. Есть, есть Пасха. Здесь Пасха, да, кстати. Да. У, вас, у вас же это страстная суббота, у вас завтра. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, завтра уже Пасха. У меня вопрос uh, про идентичность. If you want to can answer in English, it's about the identity. Do you think there is a Balkan identity? Can we speak about the Balkan identity like a cultural identity, not or not? Uh, yeah, I mean, 
do we have this picture, right? Um, uh, with the Balkan identity, where is it? Yes, here, this world versus Balkan, right? Where um, I think the, the problem is uh, we always talk about ideals and, uh, you know, like this ideal view on things. And I'm quite skeptical about that. I mean, first of all, the problem is, as I mentioned, the view on the Balkans is often pejorative. I mean, here in Switzerland, for example, I, I don't know about Russia, but uh, here in Switzerland, it is badly seen. Um, we, we often make jokes about uh, Balkan people. Um, yeah, so like I would I would say it it is difficult in that sense. I would say on the one hand, it is too idealistic to say there is a Balkan identity. On the other hand, we have to be honest. There is nationalism is is quite widespread in the Balkans, unfortunately. Um, so it is much more problematic, and um, I think I think. What is what is true is that uh, we did some field work in the Republic of North Macedonia and in other places. Is what 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 we see is um, when when it's not a nationalist stance, at least this acceptance to towards others is really something typical of the region. I'm always um, surprised because Switzerland. Uh, we love to point out that we have four national languages, that we have, that we are so international and everything. Uh, but actually, I was surprised when I did field work in Khrushchev, uh, because we met regularly people that spoke five languages. So they spoke, uh, and we tested them. Um, they actually really spoke a Romanian, Albanian, Macedonian, uh, Serbian, and Greek. And and also in other places where they spoke Turkish, Albanian, Macedonian, uh, Armenian. So I would say, in in to a certain degree, there is something like that, and that would be this multiculturalism, and to a certain degree also multilingualism. Um, but saying there is an identity, it's difficult. I would say I, I, the problem is also if we want to be honest. In many cases, actually, it is uh, this. In, in, at least in the case of of uh, North Macedonia, it's this Yugo, Yugo nostalgia. So like where this 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 idealist picture of coexistence and everything, which is a little bit all over the place. Um, most of all, of course, because we interviewed elderly people, um, and and there where, where this like accepting is is quite big. But of, it's difficult to say whether there is. I mean. In social media, it is. I, I get all the time these videos on Balkan people and the Balkans versus the world. But I mean, I, I, I you know it better for Greece. I, I think Greek people would be, um, to a certain degree, irritated or like uh, at least confused seeing their flag as Balkan. Uh, the same, in my opinion, is true for Romanians. They, they would. I also saw Republika of Moldova where like, nobody would accept that and so it's like really funny how the, i mean this guy is also talking only about I, I think the problem then is this is this uh oversimplification or overgeneralization because uh, we see in this in this case of this guy he comes from yugoslavia he doesn't know i i bet how life is in albania or life is in greece or life is in romania or in moldova uh so yeah, I think it's off the oversimplification, but this is, let's be honest, in any case, it's the same for Switzerland, it's the same for Spain, it's the same for Russia, and it's the same for any country you name. Mm -hmm. Я хотела к этому сказать то, что, ну вот у вас в начале, по-моему, как раз было тоже в презентации, что сейчас очень популярен тренд в ТикТоке о людях, которые родились на Балканах и каких-то их привычках, и к этому еще часто добавляют как раз Россию, Украину, Белоруссию, что как бы у нас существуют какие-то такие общие, в общем, не знаю, привычки тоже связывают это с какой-то общей идентичностью, не знаю. Yes, yeah. Yeah, it it is. Yeah, as you mentioned, it's like this idealization is. Uh, it 
it, it, I mean, it's the same with Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. Mm -hmm. I mean, we also we are always put together, and it's like I think we are highly different. Uh, Maxime, <laughs> I'm quite sure can agree on that. Germans and Swiss people are completely different. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, or, or like I also like yeah. And on TikTok, I saw this trend with like this Eastern European, the East, yeah, Eastern, yeah. the the youth in Eastern Europe, and they took only pictures of Ukraine, and then like people were like, "But my my region is completely different. So like, why are you putting me into this this, uh, let's say, into this group? I like I have nothing to do with that. So like yeah, it's it's an idealization in many cases. Yeah. I think it uh, it has to do with uh, some something that we can call the center of the Balkanization, and it would be the former Yugoslavia, if you I agree, if you agree with me. So, and also have these peripheric um, cultures like Greece, like Greek culture, and something else that uh, do not agree to be Balkan. Yeah, and I mean, uh, to a certain degree, of course, you see certain um, parallels in things. I mean, um, I discussed it with colleagues, the certain constructions or like traditions that you find in, in different places. Uh, you find certain folkloristic uh, traditions in Romania and Albania. You find certain, certain constructions within like uh, villages that are similar. But it is really difficult to say this is the Balkans. And I think it's also to a certain degree, as you say, this this the center, the center that is telling people how how it should be. It's like also, if, in my opinion, yeah, in the sense that uh, I see this with Macedonia, like North Macedonia. So um, people that tell me uh, life in North Macedonia has not been as we are like as as people in Serbia believe they have never been to Serbia. They don't know how life is here, but it's like I know it, and this is this this is it. But it's the same I would say for Switzerland. I mean, for me, Switzerland is where I live. So like Switzerland is like my village, and Switzerland is like Zurich. And when like when I, I am in a in a place like Basel, I'm sometimes shocked how different they are, just because my view is different or like when people tell me how Switzerland looks for them so it is the problem that we are human beings and idealizing our own stance every time <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you very much Olivier thank you very much for the invitation and I hope it was okay and uh, if you have questions you can always write me or like comments it was very interesting thank you very much Спасибо вам. Спасибо. Thank you very much. Thank you. Keine Ursache. Rijaya And then I wish everybody happy Easter, like the ones that are celebrating now, the ones that are celebrating next week, and uh, also uh, highly Ramazan to everybody who is doing Ramazan. <laughs> happy Easter. And, Ramazan. and also you have best greetings from Sam colleagues oh thank you very much best greetings back to the same colleagues and to other colleagues and to any colleagues and anybody thank you very much. <laughs> thank you